Welcome, everybody, to our second tour of Assisi, uh, centered on the artists and the artists, artisans, past and present. Uh, my name is Ann Robichaud. I think most of you know me. I am an authorized guide for the region of Umbria as of 1997 when I passed the exams. I live in the countryside outside of Assisi with my Italian husband, Pino, who was originally from Palermo. We have three children. My daughter, Julia, is right here near me, the youngest, always helping, and especially also on these Zooms. My son, Mattia, is right here today, too. He's just flown in from San Francisco, where he lives, for a visit with his son and his companion, and it's a delight. And our son, Keegan, lives in Orvieto. Not able to guide people through the wonders of Umbria since the COVID letdown and so forth, I've centered my uh, interests and my skills, if we can speak of that, on sharing Assisi and not just Assisi and Umbria, the hill towns, even not just Umbria. We've talked about Sicily. I want to do a talk on Naples as well. I definitely want to do a talk on my favorite gem of a little island, Ventotene, one kilometer long, 700 meters wide, and it's really something just south of Lazio. And this, as I said, all this research has been very enriching for myself. So let us start our talk on the artisans and artists of Assisi, past and present, and their influence. What has influenced them? If you look at the first two photos, in the center we have Luca, who makes lutes, plays lutes, teaches lutes, he makes all kinds of plucking instruments, string instruments, and influenced by a fresco in the Basilica, we'll be talking about that. And then on the right, you can see uh, Rosano Rondoni, we'll meet him, the sculptor, very influenced by the carvings in the Basilica of St. Francis, you can see a photo under him. And also we will meet people who do the uh, CZ cross stitch as well. But let us start right in the main square. There's no better place at the Zubali Bookshop. Zubali Bookshop founded in 1870. And it is a, a store which is once a print shop, a typografia. And it was opened by Luigi Zubali uh, years ago in about 1870, even before 1870, who took over a pre-existing print shop. Then his son Ernesto helped him in the print shop, and finally his son Luciano. Luciano was probably running that shop in 1970s when we moved here. I don't have a recollection of Luciano. My recollection is of Maurizio Zuboli, who returned from travels and work abroad in 2011, uh, excuse me, before that, in um, 1982, he retired in 2011 because his father was ill. He was a topographer. He and his wife had worked in different areas of the world. I said, was it difficult to come back to this medieval hill town? He said, well, I miss the contact with people of uh, various professions and so forth. Um, also, I had to take on a job which required me to keep a certain timetable. And I said, you know, picking up the work of designing books, designing stationery, was that your way to create stimulus for yourself coming back to this little medieval hill town? And he said, precisamente. We see art here already in this picture. Look at the beautiful sign that is Maiolica of Deruta. It's on over the door and it is at the bottom of the two display cases. The one on the left with the books, the one on the right with some of the exquisite stationery. And the Maiolica was all done by Americo Lunghi. We have met him in my talk on the Assisi uh, back street art, the street art, the shrines and so forth. This little image of the Madonna with child is not far from the Zuboli bookshop. And the artist is Americo Lunghi, probably done in the early 1900s. Maurizio had loved drawing from the time he was a child. And in the bookshop, among the cards sold, are some reproducing his paintings. The one on the left, the fountain of the Piazza of Assisi. The one in the upper right, San Rufino after a snowfall. The one on the lower right, the market in front of the Minerva Temple. 
When I moved here in the mid 1970s, ceramic and uh, terracotta, that is, and Maiolica objects were sold on Saturday in front of the Minerva Temple. Maurizio told me that for the designs of his book covers and for his stationery, he was very influenced also by the medieval manuscripts. And the medieval manuscripts can be viewed when you come to Assisi. A couple of them, the illuminated manuscripts, are in the Museum of the Treasury, attached to the Basilica of San Francesco, and also in the museum near San Rufino. Another inspiration for Maurizio Zuboli were the grotesque, those painted images on the painted vault of Assisi, 16th century, which we talked about in my talk on Assisi street art. For those who might not have heard the talk, or for those who wish a little reminder, grotesque means out of a grotto because it is Renaissance art imitating the paintings on the walls of the golden house of the Emperor Nero. And when that was uncovered in the Renaissance period, in a, I think it was the 15th century, uh, even the young Raphael was lowered on a rope through the ceiling and he looked up and he saw splendor like this. And he will later bring it into the borders of his paintings. It will also decorate the art of Pinturicchio. We learned about him in my talk on Spello. Grotesque influences Perugino. We learned about Perugino in my talk on the city of Perugia. And here is the painted vault of Assisi on the left. And this is an um, example of the note cards of Maurizio Zuboli influenced by the Volta Pinta, the painted vault of Assisi. This is his nephew Pietro, and now it is Pietro with his brother Marco who take care of the shop. And some of the handbound books which are sold there are covered with paper which is paper uh, taken from the uh, designs of the painted vault. These are uh, pieces of note cards of Maurizio Zuboli, and you can see here also these images very influenced by the design of the Volta Pinta. Not only by the Volta Pinta, but by medieval bestiaries. Books in the Middle Ages, which were often illustrated with animals, and sometimes the animals represented vices, sometimes they represented virtues. And the painted vault uh, is an inspiration for the borders of his stationery. Uh, the cards which reproduce some of the masterpieces in the Assisi churches. Those of you who've been in Assisi may recognize here Cimabue's marvelous fresco of uh, Francis of Assisi done in 1280. And look at this border. It's very reminiscent of the designs in the painted vault. Uh, this is from um, Pietro Lorenzetti, uh, early 14th century, the Madonna and Child, crucifixion also of Pietro Lorenzetti. And this is another example of uh, the fine illuminated manuscripts that one might be able to see, depending on what you're able to visit while you're in Assisi. Uh, Salterio is a Psalter, I believe is the correct word in English. It's 13th century, a collection of Psalms. And this book was on display this week when I went to the museum attached to the Cathedral of San Rufino to do some research for this talk. And I knew that I would be able to see an illuminated manuscript there. They always have one or two on display. The Cathedral of San Rufino, 12th century. Let us remember it is the church, the Cathedral of Assisi, housing the body of the first Christian Bishop of Assisi, Rufinus, who is the patron saint of Assisi. We're all remembering that Francis is the patron saint of all Italy, and he was martyred in 238 AD. And San Rufino greets you when you go into the wonderful Museo Diocesano di San Rufino, the Diocesan Museum of San Rufino. This image of him is taken from a medieval triptych. 
And I just want to show you a detail of that exquisite illuminated manuscript letter and very influential in the note paper and book covers and so forth designed by Maurizio Zuboli, who's retired. But all of his work is reproduced and sold in the bookshop. This is an epistolario. An epistolary is a collection of letters. And this is 13th century. It is in the Museo del Tesoro or the Museum of Treasury, which is attached to the Basilica of San Francesco. Look at these whimsical little animal figures here. 13th century illuminated manuscript. And look at these whimsical animal figures here designed by Maurizio Zuboli. So, you know, it has just been wonderful researching this to come to know how much the artisans and artists of Assisi have been influenced by past art and um, artists and artisans and have observed the art which is around them. They're not taking it for granted. They're incorporated into their work. Maurizio Zuboli also developed the marbleizing of paper it is now done by his uh, nephew here, Pietro, since Maurizio is retired as of 2011. Marbleized paper was first done in China centuries ago, then in India, then in Persia. And as of the 18th century, the marbleizing of paper was done for the decoration of book covers and so forth in Italy. And the marbleizing is done in this way. I'm going to see if I can show you. This is a video that they had done. Pietro is doing this. Uh, the colors used will either be oil paints or acrylics. They're dropped on water. Then they're going to be moved about. At one time, the fixative was, you see, he's moving them about with just a kind of little stick or a pen. Uh, the fixative at one to adding another color now, the fixative at one time was North Sea algae. Now their fixative is made with a cellulose material. And uh, this is a piece of the marbleized paper of the Zubali bookshop, which will probably be used to, uh, let's see if he's going to turn it over for us. Yes, which will probably be used on a book cover. Isn't that just stunning? And the books, let's see, I want to show you this. There's another piece of marbleized paper. And there you can see some of the books. Those books, by the way, are all hand bound. And I'm proud to say they're hand bound by my brother-in-law, Gianfranco Alagna, who's the younger brother of my husband, Pino. And when Gianfranco came up here and stayed with us years ago as a young man, he wanted to find himself a profession. He took a three year course in book binding, book restoration with particular emphasis on restoration also of objects in parchment. I said, Gianfranco, how did this idea come to you? And he smiled at me and he said, Anna, passione familiare, family passion. By that, he means Pino's family is a family that's always read many books. The love of books is family passion. And he took that into the field of, of making books. This are, these are some of the shelves here covered with marbleized paper. Here, all bound in leather by Gianfranco. And there he is at his loom. Uh, it is a loom for paper uh, bookmakers, and he is sewing those pages, and they often use handmade rag paper. He's sewing those pages, eight pages at a time. He did all these books. This is a set of Fioretti di San Francesco, the delightful stories about San Francesco, which have been told since the Middle Ages. And there's John Franco at work here. He's about to do the binding of a book. So when you are next in Assisi, you don't want to miss a stop at the Zuboli bookstore on the main square. It's right across from the temple to the goddess Minerva. Here we see the books. Here all the stationery. And also they have excellent books 
also in English, about the art and history of Assisi. And after you leave the bookshop, you want to walk down the hill in a road called Via Fontebella to visit the bottega or the workshop of Rossano Rondoni, sculptor in wood. These are some of his scalpels. And he told me that he was inspired, as many, many of these artists have told me, he was inspired by family traditions, by learning from relatives. And he said one of his first teachers in working in wood was actually his bisnonno Domenico, which means great grandfather. He was an art restorer, a painter, a sculptor as well, and his son, and that would have been um, Rosano's grandfather. And he said, I used to sit at his feet in the bottega, in the workshop, and play with the chips that fell on the ground. And as I got older, I would pick up a, one of the tools, a scalpel, and I would carve. And this is the first work he carved. He was a teenager. It is the griffin, part eagle, part lion, king of the land, king of the sky. In the Middle Ages, the griffin will represent Christ in his human, in his uh, dual nature, human and divine. Um, those of you who have heard my talk on Perugia, remember the griffin? It's on the coat of arms of the city of Perugia. Those of you who heard the talk on Deruda will remember the griffin. It's also on the coat of arms of the city of Deruta. The piece on the right in the blue and red, it's a large piece. It was ordered by a mayor of Assisi years ago, and then the city changed in an election and a new mayor was elected and that new mayor decided not to buy this piece. So it's in Rosano's studio, his bottega. And this is the coat of arms of the city of Assisi. Those of you who, who were able to hear my talk on Calendimaggio, our medieval festival, will remember the two colors. Blue for my part, Assisi di sopra, and red for the enemy side, Assisi di sotto, lower Assisi, upper Assisi. So the coat of arms of the city of Assisi is white cross on a blue background and a triumphant rearing regal lion on a red background. Now look at this piece, is that stunning? This everybody is the headboard of a bed for a couple from Northern Italy, Friuli. They asked Rosano to design them a headboard. He created this motif, look at the, not just the garlands of fruit, the ribbons and the three-dimensional perspective in this swirl of ribbons. And this is a headboard for a double bed. There is Rosano working on it. And I noted a lot of pomegranates here. Uh, you can see them bursting open. Uh, pomegranates with their seeds bursting open is symbol of fertility. <laughs> And it's going to be on the bed head of this couple. And I said, did you do that on purpose, Rosana? He said, precisamente, but they love it. <laughs> so this is the headboard. And I want to show you another detail. You see the pomegranates here. And like many an artist, medieval or Renaissance, he put his self-portrait into the work. Where is it? Let's find it. Right here. That's his self-portrait. He said the couple may not even notice. He won't show it to them if they see it fine. And in the center, and let's just go back and see the center piece. He said the center piece of this headboard is Cupid. And he said to me with a wink, the God of love. Look at the feathers. And inspired by certainly the sculptures of some of the angels in the Basilica of St. Francis, which we'll be seeing. And I asked him, can I ask you about how much this headboard will cost when it's done? I think he's been working months and months for sure. I don't know how many. He said it'll be 5,000 euro. That seems like a bargain to me for what it is. This is walnut. Isn't that something? And I said to Rosano, what's been your inspiration? Knowing it was going to be something around him. He said, my inspiration, Anna, 
it's down the hill. And I said, ah, the basilica. He said, the doors of the lower basilica. And there's the Basilica of San Francisco, 13th century, dedicated in 1253. Uh, houses the body of Francis of Assisi, who died in 1226. And this is the entrance to the lower basilica, which is Romanesque. The upper basilica, Gothic. We note the flying buttresses here. And... Here are the doors, wooden doors, 15th, 16th century, probably, leading into the lower basilica. When I was there uh, 10 days ago, no one was there except one Franciscan, uh, Padre Raffaello from Portugal. So we had our picture taken together. And I was there to study and really see the wooden doors at the entrance of the basilica. Because as I mentioned to some of you who were here when we started, as a guide here, you're taking your people in to see 10,000 square meters of frescoes in the lower and upper church. And you've got about an hour and a half to do the church and it's not enough time. So none of us really even take three minutes for the doors. We just go in, <laughs> not anymore. This couple from Northern Italy, you see their mast. They were there about 10 days ago on one of the days I was there. And they were going in. We just talked briefly. I asked where you, they were from. And they asked where I was from. They recognized my accent. And I said, I'm a guide. I'm American, not working. And they said, um, are you going in to see the frescoes? I said, I'm here to see the doors. And I said, look at those doors. And we talked about the doors. And they thanked me for having mentioned the doors. They were tourists from Italy. And they, too, were going in to see the frescoes. So I just like to remind everybody in your travels, notice details like doors. They're not just apertures to get you into a place. In Italy, they're often works of art. This is one of the doors. This is San Francesco. And the scene below is San Francesco taming the wolf of Gubbio. And you'll remember that story if you heard my Gubbio talk. And behind the wolf is the walled city of Gubbio. And some of his friars saying, oh, Mamma Mia, look at him. Look at Francis. The, the wolf is kneeling in front of him. They're absolutely astounded by the skills of their frate Francesco, their brother Francis. And here we have Francis, the wolf of Gubbio. Claire of Assisi is on another door. Those of you who heard my talk, uh, Assisi outside the walls, will remember we talked about San Damiano and she held the monstrance holding the sacred host out the window of San Damiano to scare away the Saracen pirates attacking Assisi, early 13th century. Now, notice please the fruits, intertwining fruits on the borders of these doors. and certainly influence the design of the headboard of Rosano Rondoni. This is a picture frame he made. This is a copy of a Renaissance uh, artwork. And again, the fruit. As he said, I've studied those doors of the Basilica of St. Francis. They've been my great inspiration. Look at this garland here, the framing. Um, these are the cusps on the entryway to the Basilica of San Francesco, the lower basilica. Francis over one door, Christ over the other door, because Francis is called the Alter Christus, said to be the saint who most lived his life in imitation of Christ. On one of the doors, there's this horrific jester. And I'd never really noticed him. And he's a delight. And his tongue is hanging out. And it's almost as if he's saying to the person going in, ha, 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 what are you doing here? Or, you know, what did you think of it as they come out? And I think this gesture influenced his design. He's doing a Bacchus sculpture. And before he sculpts in wood, he makes a clay model. So his Bacchus was very influenced by this um, menacing gesture, if you will. Uh, this is a tabernacle that Rosano is making. It's in walnut. It still hasn't been stained. It is for a church in Marciano in Southern Umbria. Look at the sculpture work. Notice the vegetation here, the vegetative motifs. Look at them here. This is inside the Basilica of St. Francis. This is inlay. Rosano doesn't do inlay, he told me. He does only sculpture. And this is a Renaissance piece, and boy, this vegetative motif 
it's very much influenced him and in his sculptural work. Now, around the back of this tabernacle, let me show you, is an angel, a winged angel, garland of fruit, and the winged angel we're going to see right in the Basilica of St. Francis. This is on the lectern where the priest will put the prayer books when reading uh, the prayers of the mass. It is right in front of the altar of the upper church. Ladies and gentlemen, I've walked past that lectern many times. I've never studied and observed the lectern. I had never observed this little angel. It was Rosanna Rondoni's sculpture that made me look for this angel. Those of you who've been in the Upper Basilica will recognize the frescoes, end of the 13th century attributed to Giotto, but <laughs> that's a whole question. Uh, Francis praying before the crucifix of San Damiano, et cetera. So we're in the Upper Basilica of San Francesco. The IHS, symbol of another great Franciscan, Bernard of Siena, who preached through Umbria in the 15th century and always held up a plaque with IHS, Jesus Hominum Salvatorum, Jesus Christ, Savior of Mankind. An angel appears also on the lower level of the lectern because the lower level has around it the four symbols of the evangelist. These are two of them, Matthew's angel, John's eagle. And then this is the stunning choir stall of uh, the Upper Basilica of San Francesco, done by Domenico Indivini from San Severino de Marche. It took about 10 years, from about 1491 to 1501. He worked with many assistants, 102 stunning choir stalls, inlaid and sculpted. Here's an example of the inlay. Now, please observe the floral motifs at the cusps here of the seats. These are right near the altar. So here's the angel Gabriel asking the Virgin to be the mother of God. And here's the young Mary with her hand up as if to say, who me? This is the symbol of the Franciscans, crossed hand of Christ and crossed hand of Francis, both with the holes because Francis had the stigmata. Now, we're going to see this rosette motif in Rosano's work. This is a picture frame. See that rosette motif? So influenced by what he saw every day as a child, the work in the Basilica of San Francesco. Now, on each end of the choir stalls is the signature of the sculptor. And look at this rosette again. This is all sculpted. This is inlay. And this is his name, but it's really saying Domenico of San Severino. And it was finished in 1501. Rosano signs his work too. Sometimes he sculpts it, as he showed me here, Rosano Rondoni. And sometimes he prints it with a stamp. I believe the stamp was made in Florence for him. He designed it. And there's a prancing horse. He's a rider. So he sculpts in the morning and he works out with his horses in the afternoon. And of course, about 25 years ago or more, when his little daughter was born, before she was one years old, she had a rocking horse made by her father. And it's still in his workshop below, again, that beautiful picture frame. In the workshop near his tools, oh, this is a pair of feet I hadn't even noticed before, actually. In the workshop near his tools is a horseshoe for good luck and the red corna or the horn, which is the symbol for good luck in Southern Italy. So this is so that his work will come out successfully. And all I can say, Rosano Rondoni, is buona fortuna and all the best of luck to you. And if you're ever in Assisi, whether you're on a tour with me or not, and you want to see his work, let me know and I'll give him a call and ask him to open his bottega because it's something else. I've known this lovely woman, Antonietta Mancinelli, for many, many years because she and her husband, Carletto, uh, ran together. Unfortunately, we lost Carletto due to illness some years ago. The wonderful Ristorante San Francesco right in the front of the Basilica, but I never knew 
that she is one of the masters or mistresses of the Assisi stitch, il punto Assisi. Here she is working on one of her pieces. She told me, I cannot imagine a day without a needle in my hands. And I asked her about her inspiration. And she said, the art that we have around us and that we love, and also very much for me, the Basilica of St. Francis, because it's right in front of our restaurant. She said, I love to experiment. I love to create. Each of my works for me represents the force and the dedication of the artist. She must have 25 embroidered pillows. She has endless bedspreads tablecloths. She never reproduces one. She will not work on commission. She will not make anything twice. She started doing cross stitch, learning from her mother and her grandmother when she was five years old. This was her first piece. She finished this as a teenager. This is her current piece that she's working on now. Punto Assisi. And I said, what about these designs? Where do your, many of your designs come from? And she, she creates some of them, but she said many are due to a distant relative, Signora Maria, who was born in 1872. She died in 1946. And some years after, we found the scrolls with her designs. And these scrolls were divided between myself and a cousin who also, male cousin, who also loved to do cross stitch. So here, look, you see this? This is the little angel. Here's the design. So this design was probably worked out by Signora Maria, certainly before 1946. We don't know when. There are some of her pillows. She said that I think they, she said, I think in our house, we must have 25. I particularly want to talk about this pillow. This pillow is made from a design she found among Signora Maria's designs. And Signora Maria, when she got elderly, she just scrawled something on the scrolls. And on that scroll, she had scrawled Orvieto pillow, Cuscino di Orvieto. And this is the Orvieto pillow that she has made. Isn't that amazing, amazing? And I said, the Orvieto pillow. And she said, I didn't know what she meant either. And then, Many years later, I was in the Zubali bookshop and I was looking through a book on Orvieto, trying to figure out where this came from. And I read about the painter Signorelli who frescoed in the San Brizio Chapel in the Duomo of Orvieto at the end, uh, very end of the 15th century, early 16th century. Now, please observe this design here. You see this horse? There it is, look at that. You see that? Luca Signorelli, the Orvieto pillow. And these frescoes were probably done, I think very end of the 15th century, very first year of the 16th century. And the motif is this grotesque. This is the chapel of San Brizio in the Duomo of Orvieto. And here, we have one of the doors of the lower Basilica of San Francesco. This motif is really all grotesque. Look at some of the floral motifs that also Rosano Rondoni picked up. And look at this face here, this horrific face right here. Picked up in one of the pillows of Antonietta Mancinelli. Isn't this just astounding? This is work, everybody, that it's been in Antonietta's house for years. I mean, I never knew what was in her house. I knew her as a lovely lady who'd seat us if we went into the restaurant. And it was due all due to this research this week that I found out that she is one of the experts in Assisi on the Punto Assisi. Now, not only does she bring art into it, artworks, frescoes, and so forth, she brings in the Maiolica, the ceramics the Raffaellesco pattern. There it is in a tablecloth. Is that astounding?
And let us remember, we talked about it in our Deruta talk. For those of you who weren't there, I'm happy to remind everybody or to let you know that Raphaelesco means Raphaelish because he was very influenced by the grotesque motif. So this is one of the classic Deruta patterns, Raphaelesco, and there it is in a tablecloth. Isn't that something? And this is very lovely. She calls this her pandemic ex voto, this piece. An ex voto is either thanks for a favor received or a request for a favor. And you'll be invoking the Blessed Virgin. You might be invoking Christ. And she was invoking the Blessed Virgin, Mater Divine Grazie, Holy Mother of Graces. And then the inscription under it in Latin says, please intervene for us all. And she did this during COVID. It's a wall hanging in her house. And you can see Fechit done by, and over here her initials, Antonietta Mancinelli. And you know what? In the case of Antonietta Mancinelli, this was an ex voto in both senses. It was thanks for a favor received, and it was a request. What was the request? Keep us healthy. She developed COVID, and she had COVID. She was hospitalized, she was on an oxygen tank, but she's fine now. And so this was an ex voto requesting that she be taken care of and an ex voto of thanks that she was taken care of. And then one of her most precious pieces was the piece she did, a table runner. It will always be in her home and it was dedicated to her husband, Carlo Angeletti, CA. This is Antonietta Mancinelli and M. And this is a quote from Cicero. You are always in my mind and in my soul. And she said, Carletto was my greatest inspiration. I never knew this either. And she said, in the afternoon, we'd take a break from the restaurant. We'd go home and I would do my cross stitch because I've done it every day of my life since I was five years old. And Carletto might be laying on our sofa, maybe watching TV, making maybe taking 40 winks. And I'd be doing a work and I'd always ask Carletto, what do you think of it? What color should I use? And she said he was my greatest fan, my greatest inspirer. So this is dedicated to him. And this is an exquisite piece, which comes from the Sala de la Audienza del Colegio del Cambio. This is Perugia, done 1496 to 1500 by the great Renaissance master of Umbria, Perugino. This is the room of the audience hall of the Money Changers Guild. And the decoration is, of course, this splendid, grotesque ceiling. And I want to show you that detail. This is Birth of a River, and it's taken, here it is, taken from the ceiling of the Sala de la Udienza of Perugia. And you can see this woman, maybe a nymph, is holding a little animal, also in the original. And the winged figure, also in the original. So inspired by the extraordinary Renaissance masterpieces of Perugia, of Orvieto, of Assisi. This is one of her pieces. Isn't that just extraordinary? One of her pillows. And do any men do cross stitch? There's Signor Vittorio, 82 years old. He told me that he started doing cross stitch when he was five years old. He loved it. He learned from his mother. He learned from his grandmother. And then he said, and I used to do the designs for my mother. And the women in the family had a kiosk, a little kiosk selling souvenirs near the church of San Pietro. And as they waited for tourists to come and buy something, they would do cross stitch. And sometimes they were doing the designs which he had created for them. And he met me in front of the little kiosk today, which his daughter runs. It's been in the family. I think they've had a kiosk in a of souvenirs since the 1950s. I said, 
Maria Cristiana to the daughter, what were they selling in the, like the 1960s and 1970s? She said, mostly we were selling cross uh, the Assisi stitch and a little bit of ceramics. And she said, I remember in the late 1960s, we sold these Maiolica plates and on the front were portraits of John Kennedy and Pope John the 23rd. I said, I remember those plates. I saw them in Rome as a student. And Signor Vittorio proudly showed me uh, some of the work he's still doing. He said, I can do less because I was operated for cataracts. And this is one of his little drawings. And he was for many years, now he's retired, of course, Metra in one of the Assisi hotels, the Hotel Windsor Savoia. And he said, but to relax, I like to do the cross stitch. And uh, he brought his bag to show me with his, you know, his needles, his measuring tape and so forth and was delighted to show me everything that he used to work with. And he's sitting in front of the uh, kiosk uh, where souvenirs are sold now, right on one of the parking lots of Assisi. And there is his lovely daughter, Maria Cristiana. Neither of them remember who did this cross stitch or excuse me, a CZ stitch. The CZ stitch is a combination of a running stitch and a cross stitch. Um, in another talk, we could talk about embroidery, but I couldn't include in this talk also all the technicalities of the Punto Assisi, but it's a stitch that's been done in Assisi for well over 200 years and also in other areas of Umbria, but it originates here. They don't know who did this. They have it in a plastic bag in a drawer in their little souvenir kiosk because uh, Maria Cristiana told me today, most people aren't looking for the cross, for the Assisi stitch. They're not familiar with it. They're not appreciating it. They're more likely to buy it, depict it on a plate or depict it on a pitcher or a little sachet of lavender with some Punto Assisi rather than buying one of these stunning textiles. So, you know, as you go through Assisi, what I never knew and I learned over the past couple of weeks is many of the souvenir shops of Assisi, if you ask, they have in the drawers some stunning Assisi stitch pieces, but they're not on display because the average tourist isn't interested in buying them. Their first kiosk was right across the street from the 11th century Benedictine Abbey Church of San Pietro. This is the oldest church in Assisi. And if you go inside, there's a beautiful Romanesque church with a raised altar. And the altar cloth is an altar cloth of Signor Vittorio. Here it is. This is the centerpiece of his altar cloth. He has done many liturgical linens for convents, monasteries, churches. He also did one for Pope Francis, uh, uh, Benedict XVI, and many of his cross or his Assisi stitch works have been gifts. Now, I went to the church of San Giacomo de Muro Rupto, which means St. James of the Broken Wall, because it's set into some of the medieval wall of Assisi, which is crumbling. And I looked up at the sign, Laboratorio San Francesco, the St. Francis workshop. And I smiled because I remembered bringing our daughter Julia here when she was little, she's about 35 now. She's her mid thirties. She came here in the summers when she was seven or eight years old with some of her friends to a little play group workshop run by the Franciscan sisters. And this was the equivalent of what we did in the United States, summer recreation programs. In the time, at this time in Assisi, we didn't have the Olympic style pool. Later on, these little workshops run by the sisters end because children are going to the swimming pool where they do all kinds of, you know, summer recreation problem programs. But at that time, they would come to the good sisters and she would come in with her friends and they would go into the inner cloister of the nuns up to their beautiful gardens, play in the garden, and they would do theater workshops, play, have a snack, uh, and one of the nuns would teach them cross stitch. I said, were there boys with you too? And she said, yes. And this is the part of the beautiful cloister. 
Now, this is one of the oldest churches in Assisi. This was Benedictine. It was built in about 1080. This is an 11th century uh, section of the cloister. And I was here to meet Tiziana Borsellini. And she has this box and bag full of Assisi, uh, Punto Assisi, Assisi Stitch Treasures, because she is the current president of the Academia Punto Assisi. It was founded in 1998, which was the year after the earthquake of September 26, 1997. And I said to her, why was it founded? How was it founded? And she said, it was founded by those of us who loved our Assisi, wished to continue its traditions and to diffuse the news of our traditions and a particularly one of the most beloved of our traditions, which is the Punto Assisi. At one time, the Punto Assisi was taught by grandmothers, aunts, mothers, and also in the convents. And right in this area where there is now the Academia Punto Assisi, as of 1902, there was another association and it was called Laborat, let me read the name, Laboratorio San Francesco e Ricreatorio Festivo per le Povere Fie del Popolo Residente in Assisi. San Francesco Laboratory or Workshop for rec both recreational and festive for the poor daughters of Assisi residents. So here at this laboratory, young people could learn not just Punto Assisi, but crocheting, knitting, and sewing. And as Tiziana said, it was so that they had an economic independence wouldn't have to end up in the factory, wouldn't have to leave their families, could do this stitchery work, knitting and so forth at home. And she said at times into that workshop were welcomed as many as 80 orphans and they slept in different convents of Assisi actually. She started to embroider when she was five years old. She was taught by her mother and her grandmother. She said, my grandmother even exported her embroidered textiles to the US and Japan with many orders from convents and monasteries for liturgical uh, linens. So in more than one uh, convent of Assisi, uh, young women were taught sewing, knitting, crocheting, and embroidery. And in all of the convents of Assisi, the cupboards are filled with Punto Assisi treasures of liturgical linens, you can rest assured. It would be wonderful to sometime go into some of these sacristies and ask to see the treasures. Now, uh, she showed me many of the treasures of this academy of the Assisi Stitch. One is this lamp <coughs> and the lampshade in the Assisi Stitch is taken from the 12th century door of the Cathedral of San Rufino, two peacocks drinking out of a vase. Now, she said herself, she told me that um, when I asked her about how often do you embroider, you know, she embroiders all the time. And she says, I can see an object I like and I can design it, but I'll always be respectful of the medieval bestiaries, bestiaries, bestiaria in Italian. I think we'd say bestiaries, medieval books in which the illustrations often depicted animals. This is an example of a medieval bestiary, and you can see this a motif is taken and very much influenced by these medieval bestiaries. Here are some of the more uh, beautiful pieces of this done by the women who participate in this Academy of the Assisi Stitch. There are about 100 members. 10 of them are teachers, including Tiziana. They also do volunteer teaching in the Assisi schools. They work with children who are challenged. Um, they also uh, teach lessons, which people can sign up for. Those are paid lessons to you know, give some support to the organization. And here are some examples of the medieval bestiaries which inspire the works. And this one here is a beautiful tapestry. It was a gift of uh, the, Academy, the Academy of the Assisi Stitch to the mayor of San Francisco some years ago. 
when they went to San Francisco, they did courses, they taught courses in the Assisi Stitch in San Francisco and also in Arizona at the time. These are young women of Assisi, and this is Rita. She's holding up one of the tablecloths that are for sale in their store, but they keep it upstairs in their house. This is a tablecloth which seats a 12, and I think its price is roughly 5,000 euro. This is a tablecloth which maybe is only 4,000 euro. It's in the round and Rita and her sister Roberta explained to me much more difficult to do a tablecloth in the round because of the counting of the stitches and so forth. It's much easier to work on a rectangular basis or a square basis. And these are some of the beautiful tablecloths which they have, they're not on display. They would be shown by, to people who request, ask them if they have any Assisi uh, stitch and they're folded and they're put away and they're up in their house. I said, who did these? And they didn't know who. Their father years ago did designs. He's deceased now. And he would give these designs to the country farm women, to women in villages around Assisi. They would be paid and they would execute the designs and they would be paid. And then the textiles would be sold in the shop. This is another one with the you know, medieval animal motif um, of the Academia of the Punto Assisi. Um, Tiziana showed me with great pride the textiles given to the princess Giovanna of Savoia when she married Boris of Bulgaria in Assisi in October of 1930. And she said the textiles were done taking one week long 12 young women working 24 hours a day. They worked in teams. So these textiles were the equivalent of uh, 12 people, 24 hours a day for seven days, you can imagine. I said, where are they now? She said, how we wish we knew. They have no idea. Now, this is a uh, textile in the Assisi Stitch of the Basilica of St. Francis. And the drawings were done by Antonio Mensolini. I never knew he did drawings of Assisi cross stitch. I've known him for years since we came to Assisi. He was a plumber and in middle school he became a plumber and then he decided very quickly he didn't like plumbing if you will. And he's an artist and sells his drawings and so forth in Assisi. And I would often stop there when I was doing tours because we'd pass and people liked meeting a local artist. And I never knew that he also did uh, designs for women to produce Assisi cross stitch motifs. This is the Roca Fortress of Assisi. Uh, this is the Church of San Damiano to be done in cross stitch, the Basilica of St. Clair, all designs by Antonio. And um, also Tiziana showed me before I left one of their most important designs, which is called Sette Soli. Legend tells us that Claire of Assisi did uh, embroidery. We don't know what stitch she would have done and with her sister. And Mary likely, probably, because they were quite well to do and probably taught by their mother, maybe by their grandmother. And then also Sette Soli, Jacopa de Sette Soli, who was a noble Roman woman, uh, when she came to Assisi to be with Francis as he lay dying, he had sent for her. She was very devoted to him. She really becomes the first Franciscan tertiary because she was noble and married, but embraced the rule of poverty after knowing Francis. It said she brought a mantle for him to be wrapped in as he lay dying. This is legend. But one of the most famous stitches taught by the Academia di Punto Assisi is called the pattern of Sette Soli, Jacopo de Sette Soli, Jacopo of the Seven Sons. So it has seven roundels with motifs in it. This is one of their most precious designs here. And let's see, it will become the logos of the Academia Punto Assisi. This is done in the stitch of Assisi. That's uh, Tiziana herself working on one of her pieces. And here she is presenting a piece 
to Pope Francis when he came to Assisi in 2013 for the Feast of Francis. And I asked her about the meeting and she said, I said to the Pope as I presented it, and obviously she's speaking in Italian, the translation is this, may this thread unite all men in a world of peace. And I said, what was his reaction? She said he smiled and gave me a huge hug. And she's being presented to Pope Francis by the Bishop of Assisi, who's showing the Pope the beautiful handwork. And we can't talk about the artisans of Assisi without mentioning Luca Piccioni, astounding young man who is a teacher of lute and medieval stringed instruments, as well as a craftsman who makes them. He was inspired by taking lessons, guitar lessons as a child uh, from a gentleman of Assisi, Vincenzo, who also uh, made medieval instruments. And he studied in Perugia and for his music exam, he made his own guitar. I think this was before he was 20 years old. He studied medieval instruments, the playing of them, the making of them in Verona. He also studied in Switzerland and he now is in Assisi in his workshop uh, making medieval instruments, um, stringed instruments. This is a photo of him as a young man and he's holding a vujuela which is first made in Spain in the Middle Ages. And he had made his own that he played for our wonderful festival, the Calendimaggio. And if you visit his studio, you'll see um, the woods cut and everything for the prop, this is spruce, for the making of lutes or zithers or harps. And there he is when I visited him. He was uh, playing a lute, the center of uh, that lute, the rose of that lute is actually the rose window of the Basilica of San Francesco. So he's very also inspired by the art of his town. This is, uh, he was making a harp when I visited him. Uh, these photos, thank you, Andrea Kova, fine young Assisi photographer. He um, uh, helped, I think, Luca publish a book about his work. And look at Luca here. He's carving the, the, uh, the rosoni, the rose of an instrument here, making another, you know, another, another aspect of his lute making here. And he, of course, was very influenced by the art of his town. This fresco in the Basilica of San Francesco by Simone Martini uh, in the Capello in the chapel of St. Martin, he probably saw as a child on a school trip to that basilica. Because our children in Assisi for school trips, they're going to see works like this with a guide and having studied before they go. And the instruments, of course, very much impressed him. So later, when he became a craftsman of medieval instruments, he reproduced that guitarino, which is played here by a musician. And let's go back to the fresco. You can see, I'm just gonna show you a detail. This is the investiture of St. Martin as a knight. Look at the beautiful Renaissance dress here, this 14th century fresco playing a guitarino, and this is called, I think he told me we call this a double flute. And the guitarino in English is known as a G-turn. And this is a G-turn, the G-turn that he made. It's an exact copy of what he saw in the fresco. Now this is the astounding thing. He sees it in a fresco, he makes it three-dimensional and it plays, I mean, astounding, astounding. And I've just been astonished by the attack, by the talents of the people in our town. Absolutely astonished. My kids know Luca. They had no idea about his talents. And here he is holding up an image. And here is the G-turn that he made. And this is his workshop, his studio. And here he is playing the lute. And this is the rose window of the upper basilica of St. Francis, which is carved into the soundboard of his lute. Luca Piccioni, there it is.
Absolutely astounding. Of course, Luca, let me tell you, I found out this. He knows every single work of art in our town and not just our town in which medieval instruments are portrayed. So we talked about the art in the Porziuncola. The Porziuncola is a little chapel restored by Francis and his followers in the 13th century inside the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli, just below Assisi. And in the chapel near the Annunciation, above the Annunciation, there are a group of Angeli Musicanti, which means music playing angels. Uh, this is a painting on a wood panel done by Preti Lario da Viterbo in the 14th century. And I'm going to show you a detail right here of the angels. This one is playing a viela, which is a stringed instrument. It's, uh, how can we say, an ancestor of violin. This angel is playing a lute. And I called Luca and I said, you know, the, the musical angels in the Portziuncle. And he just said right away, oh, yes, the viola, the lute. He said, no, Anne, I've never made them. I mean, he knew right away what I was talking about. I just had to mention the, the Basilica of St. Mary of the Angels. He did, however, reproduce this lute. Uh, this triptych, a uh, three-partite altarpiece by Matteo da Gualdo, which is in the Cathedral of San Rufino Museum, is in great need of restoration. This is the angel here playing a lute. He's been very close to it, studied it very carefully, and he reproduced it. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Uh, the Virgin is flanked here by Francis of Assisi and by St. Sebastian. So this may be an ex voto. This may have been done at the time of an outbreak of the bubonic plague because St. Sebastian was often uh, um, invoked at times of the plague. Now, this detail, Luca picked up and there it is. That, isn't that something? And it plays. I mean, it's just, it's just astounding to me. Uh, the, 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 the soundboard is spruce, and this is parchment. It really something. He said it's owned by a um, uh, Sicilian who's a passion of medieval instruments. Um, I asked Rick to put into the chat Luca's website. You want to see it. And also um, into the chat, the musical group that he plays with. He's very influenced by artists not just to see the artist. This is a Flemish painter, Gerard David, who did his works between the 15th and 16th century. Do you see the lute? That's it. It's been reproduced by Luca. This is the soundboard. Everybody, is this astounding? I mean, it, it's just incredible. This is another piece taken from some fresco, I don't know what, some painting. This is a, an instrument that Luca made. I asked him if he had uh, um, done any of the instruments played by the angels in the processional banner, which is called the gonfalone. Francis is on the front, there's another saint on the back. This processional banner was carried in the 15th century. It was a confraternity guild members banner. You can see these are the confraternity members. And I asked him, did you do any of those instruments? And no, he has not reproduced these, but he knew very well what they were. Uh, there's a lute and, and this is a psaltery, um, a really a zither. And in a in time, we called the salterio. I also asked him if he reproduced um, the instruments in the inlay of the upper basilica choir stone. He said, Anna, I couldn't because there's not enough detail in the instrument for me to see it to reproduce it. But he did reproduce this. This is a chetra, which can be called um, a zither. This was made for this a musician who's American and he's a specialist in playing medieval music on authentic medieval instruments. He commissioned Luca to make this for him. This is from the Studiolo or the little study of the Duke Guidobaldo di Montefeltro, which was in the Ducal Palace of Gubbio, all inlay done in the 15th century. It's not there any longer. 
You know where it is? It's in the Met. I think it was uh, bought, sold, or whatever, taken apart. I think it ended up in the Met in about 1939. So this is a copy of the inlaid study of this Duke, which is in Gubbio. This is the Chaitra right here uh, in the inlay, and this is it reproduced by Luca. And he plays with a group called Anonomi Frotolisti, and he plays his lute. There are people playing zithers, g-turns, whatever, all the medieval instruments. And frottoli are polyphonic musical pieces of the 15th, 16th century. So these guys call themselves the Anonymi Frottolisti. And um, Rick is going to give you their website too, in case you want to see them or hear them play. And as I was leaving Luca's studio, he was holding the lute that he played for me with the rose window of San Francesco. And near the door is this wonderful little sign in ceramics made for him by a student. He makes lutes and stringed instruments and teaches them and plays them. And this says Luca Piccioni, maker of lutes. And now I think we'll end by hearing a bit of Luca Piccioni. Look at that soundboard. And then he was interviewed um, on Italian television. But I just wanted to give you a little touch of the sound. And I wanted to thank you for being with us today for this talk. And I'd like to close with um, a woman. And we've met men as artisans, also female artisans in the cross stitch. But here we have a female lute player. This is a delightful painting. It's in Hartford, Connecticut by Artemisia Gentileschi, um, School of Caravaggio, if you will. This is her self-portrait as a lute player. So with this, we're also remembering that it wasn't just young men like talented Luca Piccioni that played lutes, but women as well. And thank you for joining me in meeting some of our extraordinary artisans of Assisi. And I'll hope that you'll be able to come soon to Assisi. We'll go to meet some of them in person. I think it would be very enjoyable for you. I would like to thank people who have made donations for my work in this talk and thank in advance those who will make donations so that I can continue doing my investigative work of the treasures of Italy. <laughs>